Hi, and uh, welcome to seminar number nine uh, of the Elder Law 101 series that I started at the beginning of this year. Um, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney. I do nothing but Elder Law. Um, and what I've tried to do this year uh, in monthly chunks is to basically describe to folks who are older um, basically all of the issues that they might need to address or all of the major issues that they might be, need to address as they get older. So this presentation, uh, seminar number nine, is Elder Law is uh, trust what they are. Do you need one? How do they work? Uh, we've already done a number of uh, sessions. Um, we started off with my friends Frank and Mary. Uh, we always talk about Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Frank and Mary's goal in life is very simple. They want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. They want to leave their assets to their kids. Uh, we talked about Frank and Mary in the first session before they were 60 and what kind of plan they might want. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that actually again today and the, and the revocable and amendable trust that they might have wanted. We talk about Frank and Mary in their 60s as life is changing uh, in the second seminar. Then we talked about dealing with, that, with them in their 70s when they're getting older and thinking about maybe um, um, moving out of their house, moving in with somebody, shrinking down, moving people in. We, talked, we took a break to talk about taxes um, back in April, uh, and then in May we talked about Frank and Mary in their 80s, all of the things they need, need to consider to make sure that life is going to be okay for them for the rest of their lives. Then we talked specifically about why it is that everyone can qualify for Mass Health. Uh, we, we spent one session dealing with the last year of Frank and Mary's life and how that might play out and the issues that they want to be facing uh, or planning for during that time. We talked about Frank and Mary after they were dead, and we talked about a post-mortem to-do list, and now we are talking about trusts. Um, this is probably one of the most common issues that I'm facing just literally every day. Clients will come in and say, well, you know, I think I need a trust, um, and I'm not sure why, but everybody's got one, and so shouldn't I have one? And so in this case, we're, we're going to start off by talking about Frank and Mary. Uh, who are in this case young, they are, they are 60 years old and they've got their kids, Peter, Paul and Mary Jr. But first of all, we just want to take a second to talk about what it, a trust is and who a trustee is. A trust is not, for, for legal purposes, a separate legal person like a corporation is or a limited liability company. It is, the, it is a description of a relationship between two kinds of people. There's the trustee and the trustee is the, the legal owner of the property that is in trust and can deal with third parties as that legal owner and can sell things to them and buy things from them and can take out mortgages and do all the things that an owner of property can do. What distinguishes um, trust property though is that the trustee in that case is not working for himself or herself but rather for the beneficiaries, these other people who by the way can include the trustee who are the beneficiaries of the trust. And there can be more than one trustee of a trust. Um, there can be more than one beneficiary. Uh, as I mentioned, a, a trustee can also be a beneficiary. The only limitation on a trust is that you can't have a trust with just one trustee and one beneficiary. Because if you do, then the person involved simply owns the property. It's not in trust anymore. So trusts are meant to solve problems. And each each problem has a different kind of solution, but I'm going to talk about the three that folks I talk to me the most about, the three bas basic problems and the three basic solutions. When the problem is probate avoidance, the answer, the solution is a revocable and amendable trust. When the problem is asset protection for couples, asset protection as far as protecting assets from nursing homes, the solution is a testamentary trust. When a, when a single person is trying to protect assets from a nursing home, the answer is, a t is an irrevocable and unamendable trust. We're going to talk about all three. To start, we're going to go back to Frank and Mary in their 60s, and they've got their three kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And Frank and Ma Mary own a house worth about $500,000. Frank has an IRA worth about $200,000, and savings worth another $200,000. Now, if Frank dies, um, then in that situation there would be no probate um, because the assets, the, the home and the bank accounts were owned jointly by Frank and Mary and legally if someone dies as a joint owner of a bank account or a house their interest in the property simply evaporates and the other person becomes the sole owner. There is no need for probate. Uh, if you die and you own an IRA, an IRA will always have a named death beneficiary, in this case it would be Mary, 
If you die and you have a named, a named death beneficiary for a particular asset, there is no probate. If Mary were to die the next day, however, owning those bank accounts uh, and the house which are now just in her name, uh, there would need to be a probate. And so the question is, so then what happens if there is a probate? Uh, many people will, will say, well, you know, I have a will and so I, I, I'm not going to have to go through probate. No, that's not the case. The probate process applies to all assets that you die owning if they're only in your name and there is no clearly named death beneficiary. So in this case, the bank accounts and the house. Before those assets can be distributed to anyone, those assets have to go through the probate process. The primary purpose or the first purpose of pro probate is to figure out where those assets go, the assets that you die owning. Um, but before any assets can get distributed, you have to go through this process. What's the process? You have to get a personal representative appointed, someone who's going to be the representative of the estate. Before that person gets appointed, the assets that are in that bank account that, Fr that Mary died owning or the house can't be dealt with by anybody because there is no one who has the legal power to deal with them. That's what an executor, now called a personal representative, is for. Once a personal representative has gotten named, that personal representative would actually get a new, a separate tax ID number from the Internal Revenue Service because that the, the estate itself is a taxpayer, a separate taxpayer. Uh, once they, they, the, the uh, personal representative had that, uh, that the personal representative could go to the bank with that document from the probate court saying that, showing that they were approved and marshal the assets. They could close out any of the accounts that were in, in, uh, in uh, Mary's name uh, they, and then they would deposit those accounts into the estate account, the estate account that they created because they had a tax ID number. Um, that it, they, the, the personal representative would also have the power to sell the house. Uh, if that personal representative were acting pursuant to a will, uh, Mary's will, and that, and that will had specifically given them the power to sell the house without court approval, they could do that. If not, or if there was no will, uh, and Mary was simply trying to sell the house as the personal representative of an estate without a will, then she would first need to get the permission of the probate court. But in either of those cases, whether she has a house or not, or that she has a house or just has the proceeds from the sale of that house, those assets have to sit in probate for a year. The reason? Because before any assets can be distributed to anybody, creditors have to get paid. And creditors have one year from the day of Mary's death to file a claim against the probate assets. Now inevitably people will come in after one of their relatives has died and say, well, there aren't any creditors. Doesn't make any difference. Probate needs to stay open for the benefit of creditors. You, you never know whether there is a creditor who might show up. So, that, so the, the, the estate has to stay open for the benefit of creditors for a year, at which point the assets can be distributed. Where do they get distributed? Well, if Mary did die leaving a will, then they will get distributed according to the terms of that will. If Mary did not have a will at the time of her death, uh, the assets would get, uh, would get uh, um, distributed according to the so-called rules of intestacy. That is, the rules that apply when there is no will. In the case of Frank, and by the way, at the end of that one-year period, unless creditors had, had, had sued the estate and filed a claim, filed notice of that suit um, with the, uh, the personal representative, those creditors will be wiped out. Um, so, the, so the point is, there is a benefit to the, ex to the extent that you are wiping out creditors as long as you wait for that extra year. By the way, that's the reason why um, um, many people now, when they're having to go through probate, if they're worried about creditors, will actually wait for a year before they file in probate. Um, because if in the meantime, the creditors do not actually take action on their own to try to open up a probate and sue the estate, the creditors get wiped out at the end of that year. But the point is, Things have to wait for that year. So the, the, uh, the, 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 to the extent that Frank and Mary were coming to me and saying, well, if we both die, I'd rather not, we'd rather not ha that our kids have to go through all of that. Well, the answer to that particular problem is a revocable and amendable trust. They would create a trust, which would be revocable. Revocable means whatever you put into a trust, you can take back out. 
Amendable, as the name suggests, means that you could amend it. Frank and Mary could amend the trust at any time while they were alive. Typically, they would name themselves as the co-trustees of that trust, and they would transfer the house to themselves as the co-trustees. They would probably take any of their larger bank accounts, put those accounts in trust also. They would specify that when one of them dies, the other would, would stay as the sole trustee, but then, oh, and by the way, they would also, it, once they were do doing that revocable and amendable trust, they would do wills in addition. The reason for the wills is, are, would simply be to make sure that in case they forgot something uh, at the time that they did their trust or, or, or in case later on they inherited something and, and, and forgot to get the, the, the assets into trust, any of those assets which therefore needed to go through the probate process would then pass through that person's will, but the will would become a very simple document, a so-called pour-over will. The will would say, when I, when I die, any assets that are going through probate are going to pour into my trust, in this case, the joint revocable trust. After um, both parents have died, typically one of the kids ends up getting named as the trustees. You can name one or more of the kids. You can name two, you can name three. What I typically tell folks is if you're not going to name one, you want to name an odd number uh, and make it clear that all decisions get made by majority vote. That way you don't end up with things breaking down where you can't make a decision because you can't get the votes. If you have two people as co-trustees, we typically recommend that you name a tiebreaker specifically to break the tie between the trustees. That way, if the trustees can't agree, they don't have to go to court and ask the probate court to break that tie. So creditors would be wiped out um, um, in, 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 in that case because creditors would only have a claim against the probate assets. So there, there is no probate. Typically creditors are wiped out. Um, and finally, uh, those trustees or that trustee who stepped in after Frank and Mary had died could immediately sell the house and distribute the uh, proceeds because once again, there's no creditor period so you can distribute assets immediately. So that's a really common estate planning strategy for people who are younger. Now, there are a few other implications to the revocable and amendable trust that you should be aware of. For tax purposes, this trust is a so-called grantor taxable trust. That is, as long as Frank and Mary are alive, for tax purposes, both federal and state, um, the fact that the properties are in trust is irrelevant all of the attributes of the property for tax purposes are, the, are, the, are considered to be the attributes of the grantor, the person who created the trust. So in this case, if the house were in trust and Frank and Mary then decided they wanted to sell their house, they could. And for tax purposes, um, they, they, would, they would be entitled to the same capital gains exclusion that they would be otherwise entitled to as long as they lived in the house for two of the previous five years. If they hold the house until they die and the kids sell the house, at the time of the death of the second of the two of them, the so-called tax basis of this property will jump to the date of death value so that if the kids sell the house, they're not gonna pay any capital gains tax. It's all, everything is the same. If they rent out the house, any depreciation that they get, any income they get, all goes on Frank and Mary's tax return. Um, for, so for tax purposes, it's the same as if they owned it. Same thing for mass health purposes. If Frank and Mary were concerned about making sure their assets were safe in the event that either of them needed to qualify for mass health, putting them into this revocable and amendable trust will not do the trick. Why? Because for mass health purposes, just like for IRS purposes, they still control the assets. The trust is revocable, so they can always pull the assets out. It's amendable at any time. Therefore, from, for, from the mass health perspective, they still own the assets. That's the reason why when Frank and Mary get a little bit older, typically when they're 70 or older, um, and they are now thinking about, more, they're more worried about the possibility that one of them might need nursing home care, it is at that point they start thinking about asset protection and therefore thinking about how to deal with that. Now, in order to understand what they need to do for that kind of asset protection, you need to understand the basic mass health rules. So, what if Frank and Mary are alive and have these assets and then Mary needs nursing home care? And now initially she's going to be paying for that nursing home care privately if she comes directly from home. Uh, if she went to a hospital first and then got discharged from the hospital to the nursing home, typically the, the Medicare 
will pay for up to 100 days of that care, but after that, she's going to be on private pay at a bill that can be anywhere between twelve and $17,000 a month at this point. So in that situation, Mary would be really interested in trying to get, get away from that kind of very stiff monthly bill. And she could do that if she can qualify for MassHealth. And, and as a matter of fact, because Frank and Mary are both alive, Mary could qualify for MassHealth fairly quickly. Uh, and once again, clients regularly come in and they're astonished by this fact. They, they regularly tell me that they've heard radio, and radio things, they've read someplace. No, 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 if my assets are only going to be protected if I've given them all away and waited five years. Uh, that is incorrect. Um, the assets can be shifted around uh, literally the day before uh, a, a, someone qualifies for mass health if assets are being given to the spouse. So, if Mary wanted to qualify for mass health, and once again, we're assuming these are the assets, they've, she, that they've got a house worth 500,000, Frank's got the IRA worth 200, they've got savings of $200,000. Now, Mary can qualify for mass health as soon as she can show that she has less than $2,000 and that Frank, um, uh, that his only assets are the home, but he can own the home no matter what the equity in the home, and that he, ha that he has cash or cash equivalent assets of less than $148,600. But Frank, in that case, can have unlimited income, unlimited income. Therefore, Frank and Mary's basic strategy, and this can be done the day before Mary applies for Mass Health, would be to shift all assets to Frank, and remember, as I mentioned, there is no look back period regarding any of this. At that point, the house would be safe. Frank would have too much money though because he'd have more than $148,600 in assets. So what he would do is at that time, he would buy an annuity with any assets that were over $148,600. As long as that annuity was irrevocable so that he couldn't get the money back, and as long as it called for equal monthly payments to Frank, he can't get the money back in a lump sum. As long as it calls for equal monthly payments to Frank over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy at that time, the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. We've literally bought annuities in, this, in these cases of up to a million dollars. The day after the annuity is bought, the, thereby reducing the remaining assets below $148,600, uh, the, the, the spouse in the nursing home can qualify for mass health. Going beyond that though, once, and by the way, once Mary had qualified for mass health, her income from pension or social security would go to the nursing home. Mass health would pay all the rest. What Frank would, would at that point though probably also want to do would be to make sure that if he died, these assets would still be safe. And of course they wouldn't be safe if they were in a revocable trust. What he would need to do with that case would be, now that he has these assets in his name, to change his will, to specify that, so now it's no longer a will that just is a pour over will into a revocable trust. He would change his will to, by creating within that will a testamentary trust, a trust that is a part of the will. And the trust would say that if Mary was still alive, any of the assets that he owned would go into this testamentary trust for Mary's benefit. Uh, after that, after Mary dies, or if Mary has already died, the assets would simply get distributed to the kids. What has to be, what do you need to know about that testamentary trust? Well, it has to be part of the will. There is no way that you can create a separate standalone trust in order to avoid probate, while at the same time using this asset protection strategy. It only takes effect at death, and, and of course at death, that testamentary trust, which is part of Frank's will, becomes irrevocable because he's dead, so he can't take anything out of it that's going into it. The will would specify that all assets go into that trust. One or more of the kids can be the trustees. All of the assets that flow into that trust would be immediately non-countable and non-leanable if Mary le needed to qualify for mass health. The assets could be used in the discretion of the trustees to provide for anything that Mary want, might want. So if Mary was not going into the nursing home and just wanted, needed assets in order to live on, the trustees could always distribute additional assets to her. If she got those assets and then needed to qualify for mass health, 
the assets that she had that were in her name would have to be spent down to less than $2,000 before she could qualify. But all of the trust assets would remain safe. This would cover all assets that were in Frank's name at the time of his death. Oftentimes folks, even when, when someone isn't actually going into a nursing home, but folks are thinking about this, even if they're both healthy, once you get to be about 70, and by the way, I turned 73 this year, I get it, right? So once you get to be about 70, you start thinking about, well, how can, we ma I ma how can we make sure that our assets are safe if one of us dies and the other one needs to qualify for mass health? So what I'll tell them often is, get these wills in place, each one having a will with this testamentary trust for the benefit of the other. If you don't know who's sick yet, then don't ne you don't necessarily want to transfer any assets around at this point. You can leave the assets structured the way they are. However, I will tell people, if you get sick, Call, my, call your doctor first, then call me, so we can talk about who is sick and why. For example, suppose Frank called me and said, you know, I, got, I found out I have cancer. Not tomorrow, but sometime soon I may die. In that case, we may you, the Frank and Mary may decide that they want to shift all assets at that time to Frank, so that if Frank dies, the assets will be safe, non-countable, and non-leanable if Mary later needs to qualify for mass health. If on the other hand, Frank said, well, you know, I'm just having some memory problems. And so not now, but maybe in the future, I might need care at home or need a nursing home care for which I'd want to qualify for mass health. In that case, what I would probably suggest to them is that if they want to be on the safe side, they may want to shift the assets at that time to Mary. So that if Mary dies suddenly, that will is already in place with the testamentary trust for Frank's benefit and therefore all of the assets that she dies owning will be safe, non-countable, and non-leanable, right? So it works both ways. Um, as I just mentioned, many, many couples will, will, who, who are both alive and both healthy will actually adopt these plans na uh, now uh, while they're still healthy, knowing that the only thing they have to do with the last minute if somebody is getting sick is to move around the assets. Um, finally, there are a few other, other implications to a testamentary trust. One of the most positive ones that many, many people don't realize is regarding the house. If the house um, gets transferred, say, to, to, to Frank's name before he dies, uh, and then he dies the next day, the so-called tax basis of that house will jump all the way to Frank's date of death value. So if the house then gets sold, either by the trustees of the trust um, because they've just because Mary is no longer living at home and they want to just have the cash or by Mary if the trustees decide to give the house back to Mary and Mary then sells the house excuse me in either case the sale is not going to generate a capital gain because at the moment of Frank's death the so-called tax basis of the property jumped to the date of death value um, also you know once you once you got that trust those assets you would need to get a separate tax ID number for that trust and once again, the house base, basis steps up. Finally, what about the situation where Frank has died, the assets didn't go into trust because they were still held jointly, and Mary now has all of these assets. And she's now worried, given the fact that she has all of these assets, about what might happen if she needs to qualify for mass health. Because remember, for her to qualify, she would have to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. Uh, the house would not count as a countable asset, but Mass Health would put a lien on the house to make sure it got repaid following her death regarding any payments made beyond, beyond, on her behalf. Her strategy, and the only time where an irrevocable trust really makes sense, is in this situation. You have a single person who is older, who is concerned about protecting their assets, so if for, to help her sleep at night, what she may want to do is transfer her assets to an irrevocable trust, a trust from which she cannot take out the assets once she'd put them in. She would typically name one of her kids as the, trustees of, to the trustee of the trust. She, it, regarding her house, she would typically transfer a so-called remainder interest in the house to the trust. That is the interest that starts after she dies. She'd keep a life estate so that she'd be in control of the house five years in a, and then she, would also, she could also transfer cash into that same trust. Five years in a day after she's done those transfers, those assets are safe, non-countable, and non-leanable. The assets, once you put them in, cannot be taken out. Mary can't be the trustee, but she can keep the power if she's, getting, having to, if she's disagreeing with the trustee because she finds that the child that she named as trustee 
isn't turning out to be what, who, what she had hoped, she can always fire that trustee and appoint somebody else. The trust will typically name the children as the beneficiaries while Mary's alive, so that if Mary needs any money, the trustee would have the discretion to distribute some funds, or even the house, out to the beneficiaries and have the beneficiaries turn around and give them back to Mary. This, is, this, is all, this all complies with Mass Health's regulations. At Mary's death, the assets would get distributed immediately to the kids and there would be no probate. The other implications of an, irrevo of an irrevocable trust, we, you can still structure it so that it would be grantor taxable so that when Mary dies, that once again the tax basis will jump up to the date of death value. Um, the, the, the trustee, once again, will need to get a tax ID number, uh, but there will be no probate. So, those are the three trusts that are most commonly used by seniors to solve the problems that seniors have. The key is, what you want is the trust that's going to help you sleep well at night. That's the goal of this whole exercise. If you have any questions about any of this, you can always contact me. Uh, at, uh, you, can, you can watch this, this same video on our YouTube page. Um, or you can call us. My direct line is 508-860-1470. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We'll see you next month. Thank you.